At the start of this year, I made the promise to myself that I was going to be reading 20 books in 2019. However, as I built the habit and remembered how much I used to love reading books as a kid, I very quickly discovered that 20 books wasn't going to be enough. Now we're about halfway through the year and I've read 26 books or one book a week for the past six months. And these books have ranged from historical accounts to classic fiction, from philosophy to autobiographies, uh, from finance to self-improvement. And I wanted to share the lessons that I've learned from reading these books from least impactful to most impactful. First up is The E-Myth Manager by Michael Gerber. Now, unlike the other book of his that I read, The E-Myth Revisited, this book feels like a kind of unnecessary addition to the series. The main idea is that most businesses are failing because managers within those businesses are subservient to the emperor or the entrepreneur who owns the business. So to succeed as an e-myth manager, basically imagine that whatever group or unit it is within your organization that you're managing or leading is its own independent entity. Become the entrepreneur that leads that, develop your own mindset, develop your own uh, vision and go from there. And number two was Essentialism by Greg McEwen. The basic idea or value proposition of essentialism is that in order to be able to contribute to the, the most important things in life, the things that matter most, and therefore also have the most success, you need to first start saying no to everything else. It sounds like a nice idea and it truly is, but I don't think that the book really expanded on it in a, in a very meaningful way. Um, I felt that the author's writing was could, at times quite self-absorbed, sometimes kind of elitist, and the way that he was separating things or people into essentialists versus non-essentialists uh, was really extreme and often veered into these kind of unrealistic examples. Next up is The 50th Law by Robert Greene. This is an unofficial sequel to his previous book, The 48 Laws of Power. The premise of the book is that fear is a prison and it's only by overcoming our fears that we can become powerful and live a fuller life. And I completely agree with this and the lessons are valuable. However, I felt reading this that it was kind of disjointed. I also felt like you could probably get a lot of the lessons from different source material. Many parts in this book reminded me of Stoic philosophy, but kind of taken from a different angle as if the philosophies within Stoicism are actually just mechanical tools used to gain power. And in general, a lot of the lessons and ways to deal with fear seemed kind of like variations on the same thing. Or in other words, it could have been a shorter book than it was. Next up was Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, or The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. Blink explains the power of the subconscious mental processes that act rapidly and with very little incoming information without us being conscious aware of it, aka intuition. The book is enjoyable, it's engaging, but ultimately I put it down and I felt unsatisfied. And thinking more about this, I realized that Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is actually a much better presentation of this topic. It doesn't really help us evaluate when it's good to use intuitive snap judgments and when we need to stop and think more. And Thinking Fast and Slow is the book that covers that in much greater detail with a lot more psychological evidence as well. And as a slight spoiler, most of the time our intuition is actually just shooting blindly from the hip and leading us astray. So my recommendation, read Thinking Fast and Slow, and then later on if you want to, read Blink as well. Next up, As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. This is classic self-help from 1903 it was published in. The book is super short, you can read it in an hour, and it's kind of like Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, but much more condensed. It presents a whole bunch of um, natural laws, so to speak, around the power of man's thought, and its ability to influence the reality around him. It is kind of woo-woo, it is not you know, physically true, but it will pump you up and it will make you believe that you can achieve the things that you wanna achieve. And for that um, you know, motivational reason, it is a good book. But if nothing else, it's interesting to see what self-help was like in the early 1900s. The next book was the journal of Christopher Columbus during his first voyage to the Americas. What actually impacted me most was seeing the tragic beginnings to this period of first discovery and colonization, but also great destruction. The native people that existed in the Bahamas, in the Dominican, they welcomed Christopher Columbus with open arms. And after you know a few hundred years, that culture was completely destroyed, which is really sad. On the other hand, trying to comprehend that sense of romantic exploration and beginnings of something new as a traveler really gave me goosebumps reading it. And just trying to put myself in the shoes of being one of the first people to see this whole new world, this new continent, um, was really quite incredible. Number seven was Pour Your Heart Into It by Howard Schultz. And this is the account of the early days of Starbucks growing from nothing into the huge giant company that it is today. I always like origin stories and this one was really good too. Seeing that something that's so big that we take for granted today came from literally nothing not that long ago. And putting that time frame into perspective and just seeing this geometric growth um, but realizing that it's really a labor of love and sacrifice and dedication. And that that story, whether it's in this case, Starbucks or any other company or even small companies that we are starting ourselves, that element doesn't change. And if you can really give it your all and stand behind something that you truly care about, 
and do that for decades, then definitely, yeah, you can build something amazing like Starbucks. Next was the subtle art of not giving a F by Mark Manson. Or in other words, how to find meaning in your own life by actually choosing what is worth struggling for versus what isn't. I actually wanted to enjoy this book more than I did. Uh, it felt in a way like a stream of blog posts rather than a really cohesive book. And again, I saw a lot of parallels to stoicism. So I'm just gonna take a quote from the actual book. Um, improving our lives hinges not on turning lemons into lemonade, but on learning to better stomach lemons. Now, I think a stoic would say about this, we can't control whether we get lemons or lemonade, but we can control how much we decide to enjoy either lemons or lemonade, and we can choose to enjoy whatever it is that we receive. I like this book. I just wish that the ideas were wrapped up a bit more cohesively. Number nine, The Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain. This is the first of Mark Twain's of books that I've ever read. Uh, and I think it's a really great introduction to his kind of style of writing. It does, as it says on the cover, it's about two kids. One is a prince, one is a pauper, and then they comically change places. Uh, and the adventure of the book is about them trying to get back to the natural order of things. I was kind of expecting a tragic outcome, but that didn't happen. Um, and I think in hindsight, that's a function of uh, Mark Twain's writing style. It's stories about boys for boys. Um, I enjoyed this book a lot. Number 10, Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. So this book deals with the traps of ego and it separates it out into three sections which loosely model how most of us live our lives. Firstly, aspiration followed by success and then failure. For me, this is personally really valuable as I feel that I've gone from the aspire stage and I'm now starting to touch in the, into the success stage of my life. And I'm also waiting for failure to hit me at any moment. So to understand how my ego plays into this and how it can hold me back was was really quite powerful. Ego can really do a number on us if we're not careful. Firstly, it pulls us out of reality. And secondly, it gives us this sense of entitlement as our ego builds. And lastly, it makes us dependent on things that are outside our control. That is the validation of others around us. I think understanding ego in today's media dominated Trump-esque kind of era is just incredibly important. Number 11, Delivering Happiness by Tony, and I can't pronounce his last name, but it's a really good book. Tony is the founder of the billion dollar shoe company Zappos. And this book is basically about his story. And it's just a really great account of a company that is completely and wholly focused around a customer centric vision. I also really liked his writing style. He's clearly passionate about what he does. Um, it's very down to earth. He didn't use a ghostwriter and you can see that in the way that he writes. If there's one thing I didn't like about this book, it almost felt like it was too natural. Like he's clearly an entrepreneur from birth um, and he's touching the void moment where he sort of felt a bit of emptiness. Didn't really feel like it actually shaped him. It felt like he would have just done exactly what he did no matter what happened. And you know, there was no real crisis points in this book, I felt. But if you wanna start a company and happiness is one of the founding principles, then definitely read this book. The next book was The Millionaire Next Door by William Danko. This book is incredibly revealing. It is a little bit out of date. It explains what a real millionaire lifestyle looks like. What is the average American millionaire really doing with their time, with their possessions? What does their house look like? Versus the incredibly exaggerated, consumption heavy millionaire lifestyle that we see portrayed on YouTube and social media and on TV shows. What I loved is that everything is backed up with real data. That data is now a little bit out of date, but it is really refreshing to see this data showing that the average millionaire is not this Lamborghini driving 20 year old kid. And in fact, when it comes to those really extravagant lifestyles with sports cars and expensive watches, those people are actually usually much less wealthy than they want us to think that they are. Next, we have The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin. Josh has a pretty incredible story. He went from being a chess master at a really young age um, to actually being a martial arts master as well as a young um, teenager. Now, this book is more of a personal memoir rather than a sort of instructional how-to on how to actually learn, but read it in terms of a memoir and, and just the story of somebody who has a lifelong dedication to learning for the sake of learning and for the enjoyment of it. And for that reason, I really got you know, excited to, to go out and learn things myself. And so for that reason, I think it's a really fantastic book. Number 14 is The Gentleman's Guide to Passengers South by Mr. Bruce Van Sound. And this is completely a sailing instructional book. If you're not into sailing, it's not gonna be relevant to you. Uh, but this book saved my ass quite a few times, so I had to put it on the list. What was really funny was that as we left Florida and started our own journey to the end of the Caribbean, we at first had a lot of ego-based resistance to taking Van Sant's advice, but very quickly we relearned that timeless lesson that it almost always pays to have a mentor who has gone before you, who has you know been there and done that, and you can learn from their experience in a much less painful way than figuring it all out for yourself. The next book was Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. Now, it was pretty hard to actually give this book a rating because I didn't really like Steve Jobs' personality very much, um, but the book did a really good job of portraying that. So I guess that is actually a you know a compliment for the book. It makes a really interesting counterpoint to Ryan Holiday's Ego is the Enemy, where Steve Jobs was a fundamentally ego-driven personality. And I think the potential trap here is to think that being an asshole made Steve Jobs who he was. But in actual fact, he was successful 
in spite of being an asshole, not because of being one. Overall, Jobs' story really inspired me to not be afraid to be different and to think differently. It also inspired me to want to throw myself behind real creative art and, and that unyielding sort of drive to just do things for the sake of doing them, to do new creative things um, was really powerful. And the last interesting point was that despite so much being made of St Steve Jobs' you know, arrogant, abrasive, egotistical personality, despite all of that and all of his shortcomings as a person, he, when he finally passed away, he did so surrounded by a loving, caring family and he did so at peace. I found that very interesting. This one is Shoe Dog by Philip Knight. Now this is the story of the founding of Nike and it covers all of its early years um, and, his, and Philip Knight's early life as well. Now, I really like this book. I actually related a lot with the early um, person that he was as a young man. He was a traveler. Basically, his, his character is just really upfront. He is who he is and he does what he does because he wants to be who he wants to be. And he wants to experience the world and do things differently. And just like in the other billionaire books that I've read, it takes a person doing truly what they care about for a really long period of time and doing that through a vehicle that has geometric growth, which means 100% year on year, year on year, compounding for enough years and you've just got suddenly this gigantic business. Next up, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, written by Robert Louis Stevenson in 1886. This was the first time that I read classic fiction in a really long time. In terms of themes and ideas, I really liked the portrayal of man's ego, again, speaking about ego and how man tries to you know, be more than he is to escape from reality and undo perfections and how that inevitably leads to disaster and downfall. Again, it's fiction, but there is so much non-fiction and so many good principles in books like these that they're just incredible to read. Number 18 is Half the Sky. Now the theme and the content of this book is just ridiculously depressing and macabre and, and sad. And yet I found this book really enjoyable to read. This book gives a modern take on the oppression of women worldwide. What are the current issues and the scope and the scale and the magnitude of those issues, as well as what we can do about them and what we are doing about them. Now I said that this is a really macabre topic and it is, and a lot of my notes, I can't even say them on video because the stories are just so horrible to hear about. And yet at the same time, the book does a fantastic job of presenting these as Again, in turning oppression into opportunity and the ways that we can solve these problems and move forward. Reading this book, I felt incredibly grateful to be a, you know, a white male born in a developed country. It was simply a gift that was bestowed on me at birth. The next book was Profit First by Michael McCallowitz. This book is basically talking about an accounting system for business owners. Now that sounds so incredibly boring, but this book will pull you in. If you own a business, you will love this book. As business owners, we all know how dry and boring and just disconnected accounting can seem. and um, this book really does a great way of sort of breaking it down and simplifying it and changing the perspective to align with how an entrepreneur actually wants to see, you know, profits and revenues and expenses. Basically, the idea is start with profitability first. Pull money out of the business to pay yourself as a reward for growing the business and you will actually drive yourself or drive the business to greater efficiencies and to make more money. Mike is a really energetic author and he writes about his topic with a, just a lot of passion that clearly shows through. Sam Walton's Made in America was the next book. Now this book was published in 1992, so a lot has happened to Walmart since then, but this book is about Walmart. I really enjoyed the origin story, which is the first half of the book, um, a lot more than the actual sort of business practicalities once it was built up. But I think with autobiographies and success stories, it's often like that. You want to go back and you want to see the origins of where they came from, not where they ended up. It's a story of persistence and determination. And it's actually really interesting to see that Sam Walton's story doesn't start that early. Unlike some of the other billionaire books that I've talked about, at my age, Sam was only moderately successful. And it was actually that compounding over time of slow but continual growth over a really long period of time that resulted in this juggernaut that is Walmart today. At the end of the day, this is a story about somebody with strong values and a strong work ethic who worked really hard for a really long time and built something huge as a result. Number 21, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. So this book draws lessons and principles out of the heavy combat that the Naval Seals fought in Iraq and applies them primarily to business, but also to life in general. And it really is crazy to see how naturally these principles and the, these lessons, again, combat soldiers, you know, it's not really what you'd expect in business, but it flows so naturally and the principles clearly apply. I would say this book is almost mandatory reading for self-improvement, but even if you just want to read some crazy stories about what these Navy SEALs did in Iraq, um, then it's definitely worth reading. The book covers a whole bunch of principles, but the main one, which is that of extreme ownership, is something that I am learning day by day. Basically, if you want to succeed at something, if you want to have long lasting success, the very first and, and last thing that you need to do is accept that whether or not you like it, you need to take responsibility, personal responsibility for everything. The more that you blame external circumstances or other people or things that were outside of your control, the more that you try and place the blame on those things, 
the less real control that you actually allow yourself to have. Number 22, this is the little book of common sense investing by John Bogle. This book explains the quote, only way to guarantee your fair share of stock market returns. I'm gonna spoil it for you, it's very simple. It is, I'm gonna read this from my notes, invest in the lowest cost index funds to own the market, don't try and beat the market. Number two, hold those stocks forever. And that's it. The how-to is just those two points. This book covers the why, and it does so really, really well with lots of illustrated examples and calculations to show exactly all of the fallacies that we fall for or an investment advisors try and make us fall for in terms of overtrading, trying to beat the market, trying to basically get more than what we can physically get in this zero sum game that is stock market investing. So I read this book in just two days and it was critical in giving me the enthusiasm to actually go out and invest, as well as providing that long-term perspective um, that is really hard to see when you're looking at your know, day-to-day market fluctuations and everything that's happening in the news. Number 23, The Odyssey by Homer. Now, this book was published in, if I'm not mistaken, the eighth century BC, making it the oldest piece of Western literature that exists. I've wanted to read uh, classic Greek fiction for you know, ever since I was a kid and I've just never really been able to get around to it and I'm so glad that I did. The story is basically about the hero Odysseus leaving Troy, trying to make his way back home to his family. But along the way, he gets cursed by Poseidon for doing some kind of egotistical, stupid stuff on his way back home. Um, and then he has to endure a whole bunch of challenges to get back to see his family again. This book was surprisingly really easy to read and I felt just absolutely transported back into that world. And maybe it's Maybe it's just all of the Greek imagery that we've seen in, you know, in movies and books elsewhere, but I just found myself visualizing what it was like so vividly this whole, the whole time that I was reading it. And it's crazy to think that this dude named Homer wrote this book or potentially orally told it thousands of years ago. And even today, it's, it's still around. It's influenced our own culture in so many ways that you know, most of us were not conscious of it. But that impact over time is just, mind-numbing to think about. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Now this book was published in 1831. It felt very similar to Jekyll and Hyde in terms of the themes and the feeling of the story, but I liked Frankenstein a lot more. Again, we see the folly of hubris and of, of the ego of man thinking that he is capable of more than he is. And this is represented in the story primarily by the creation of the creature by Dr. Frankenstein. And again, it's fiction, but you don't have to look hard to draw real life principles and lessons out of these fiction books. Number 25, Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. Now this book really impacted me in a practical way. Maybe that's just because I'm ready for it right now. I read this book over the course of three days. I was writing notes as I went and you know, each day I was having multiple light bulb moments, which is always the sign of just a really good book. And I feel like the future of both my personal brand as well as that of my company has just taken a 180 degree turn as a result of reading this book. And if there's one key thing that I learned as a result of reading Building a Story Brand, it's that to build a brand, you aren't the hero. You are actually the guide and your customer is the hero. And this is really powerful because normally what you see in, again, this egocentric personality driven sort of media life that we live in, uh, is that it's the hero who is the guru, who knows everything, who is unstoppable. And it's that sort of worship that I think is a really unhealthy, again, egocentric approach in today's society. So if you are looking at finding or distilling your vision, if you're looking at starting a company or you already have a brand, definitely check out this book. Number 26 and the most impactful book that I've read this year is Atomic Habits by James Clear. Now this is just by far the most succinct, logical, easy to follow um, model of habit building and habit formation that I've ever seen. So the book firstly explains what is a habit and how does it function. And it, a habit is formed of four parts. Firstly, the cue, the craving, the response, and the reward. That's a habit. Once that's been explained and you know how a habit functions, the next and more important part of the book is behavioral change. How do you use that model to actually drive change in your life to achieve the, the goals that you want to achieve and to be the person that you want to be? And that is also a four part model. Um, and it's very simple and logical as well. Firstly, you make it obvious. Secondly, you make it attractive. Thirdly, you make it easy. And then fourthly, you make it satisfying. Now I have been creating habit contracts for myself, which I'm using in my daily life as a result of the things that I've learned in Atomic Habits. I'm already seeing how much easier it is to create new habits and to stick to them. And I honestly don't think it's too far-fetched to say that reading this book and putting it into practice in your life could be a life-changing thing. So. That's been my most impactful book and that rounds out the 26 books that I've read this year. I'm gonna read another 26, so if you're interested, I'll do another update on that as it goes. I hope you found this summary of all the books that I've read valuable. And if there's one takeaway that I want you to get out of this, it's not you know any of these specific books or the content or anything, it's just the fact that the art of sitting down and reading a book in 2019, when we have so many distractions, 
uh, is such a rewarding, fulfilling experience that I, I want you to be able to go and do that. And it doesn't have to be 26 books, you know, one book a week. Start with one book. If it's one book in 2019, go to the bookstore, go to Amazon, buy that book and, and just start reading it one page at a time. You'll get a lot out of it, I, I'm confident. If you did like this video, guys, please give it a like. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next video.